My name is Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us both online and in person. We are in conversation with Ukrainian journalist Sev Musayeva, editor-in-chief of Ukrainska Pravda, which translated means Ukrainian truth. Welcome to RightsCon. Uh, just some quick housekeeping. As usual, po post your questions on Slido. I get to them pretty quickly if you post them. So there's no question and answer period at the end. We'll try to integrate the questions um, into our discussion. Now, just a little bit more about Sev. She is originally from Crimea, and this is important because you are a Tatar, an ethnic group that faces persecution in Russia-controlled Crimea. And... Um, about your newsroom, it reaches more than four million people every day at home and abroad, serving as a source uh, on the war. In addition to what's happening on the front, your team of journalists have followed the money to track down Russian billionaires' yachts and planes around the world. And for this kind of work, you have received death threats and, um, and other kinds of threats to your journalists. Two of your publication's previous senior editors were murdered. Last year, Sev made Time's Top 100 Influential People list, and in 2019, you were a Harvard Nieman Fellow, and you've, co of course, received numerous journalism prize prizes in Ukraine. Sev, thanks again for joining us. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hello, Melissa. So let's just start by asking you about some of the big stories out of your newsroom in recent months. The biggest story now, of course, uh, this is them in person. Uh, maybe you heard about this. And this is a story we leave uh, last, uh, leave last uh, two days, actually. Sleep with it, with that, 24-7. Uh, two of my colleagues went to Kherson that was under occupation for several months. And now the um, Ukrainian uh, army um, on November Kherson. And now uh, Kherson is excluded by water, and they reported from this place, but also they help with the evacuation of people and animals. And this is something is about journalism and about newsroom too during this uh, 16th month of the war, because you don't have a chance just to do your work, just to report the stories from um, frontline, from such cities as Kherson, stories about war crimes against Ukrainians, but you also need to help, you also need to be a volunteer. And um, your, your conference is about human rights, and now Ukrainian journalists became a human rights defenders in their country. And the best way how they can do that they just definitely evacuated those people from flooded houses and flooded city. Yes, because as a journalist, you're supposed to be, the myth is that you're supposed to be dispassionate and ob an observer, but if you're watching human suffering, there's the humanity of just being a, not, not just a journalist, but a human being to try to help others, and I can totally understand that. Um, how do you, as editor-in-chief, sort of remind your journalists about... Um, about trying, I don't want to say it's trying to stay dispassionate, but, but for example, if, if you find something, a lead on government malfeasance, uh, go government corruption in, in Ukraine, that could potentially, you know, the country needs to be united. So how do you sort of navigate the need to continue to be accountable to the government while also wanting to support the overall efforts of the war? Thank you for this question, and it's important, of course, uh, to answer this question, and I will try to do my best. But, um, you know, with the beginning of the war, of course, uh, we reported 24-7 uh, uh, breaking stories from the front line, and then maybe last summer we understood that corruption, this is something that not disappeared just uh, after the beginning of the war. And uh, I think in, in my newsroom we had the discussion, and... Um, totally support that statement that uh, it's even more necessary to report about corruption when your country fights for the right to exist and when your country fights for the right to be a democratic state, to be a transparent state and to be a European state. That's why your work is more responsible, is more important, because um, uh, during the war we lost human lives, we lost civilians, we lost our militaries. That's why 
we have to keep uh, going and we have to cover even uh, misconducts of our officials and etc. So uh, from last summer we reported about um, such stories. We published some uh, stories about uh, high official corruptions, for example, deputy head of the presidential office, um, uh, one of the governor uh, in the um, front line city, um, members of parliament from servant of the people, and what, what I want to say, after we published the stories, already six people were fired after our investigation, investigations. So it's about also public service during the war, and it's about uh, doing continue to do your job, continue to do the work. Of course, we have even uh, among uh, all media landscape in Ukraine discussion, uh, is it the right time uh, to do such stories? This is the right time to do such stories. Uh, because we want our country not only uh, to be independent, but to be successful and to be prosperous. And that means that it, could, it, it should be country without corruption and without misconduct. And this is our job, and this is our front line during this week. Now, that, that is something that your newsroom journalists understand, but do you get a sense that uh, ordinary Ukrainian citizens also understand the need for this kind of bad press about the government, that it's part of this process of trans, uh, of being transparent? We received a huge support from our readers and from people. They actually supported us in these um, stories. Uh, and actually, after publishing the stories, also by those people were fired because it was a huge public scandal. And people, of course, told that um, during, this, during the war, such things are inappropriate, and we don't want them uh, to happen anymore. That's why it's important, and that's why also I want to say that uh, last poll showed that uh, more than 85% of people supported uh, journalists uh, for publishing uh, such stories, for publishing and for covering corruption issues. Uh, for anti-corruption investigation, etc. So we have a huge support from our people. We also have a huge support from our militaries, which is also important. So after publishing such stories, we received the messages from our friends who became soldiers, who became um, uh, who, who now fighting in the ranks of ranks of Ukrainian army, and they told us, "Okay, thank you for your job." Because we do our job, and you need to continue to do your uh, job and uh, your activity against uh, these uh, things. That brings to mind a, quest a question I asked our, our last in our last interview. Um, in the last interview I did, which was also with a journalist, but from Kenya, which is the business model, right? Uh, the Ukrainian economy has suffered terribly as a result of this invasion. And I imagine it's the same for, for newsrooms. Even before the war, it was probably difficult <laughs> to, to continue to report and come up with new business models in a very changed environment, right, of social media. How are you managing to do that? How are you fundraising? Are you getting support from citizens? And what are your thoughts about future models that might work? Uh, thank you again. Uh, yes, our business model before the war was absolutely different from what we have now. Uh, before the war, uh, we received 60% uh, from our, our advertising, from banners, from everything, from Google, um, and 30% uh, 30 percent uh, from donors. And no, no, sorry, I just, it, it, uh, it's a mistake. So we received 70% uh, from uh, advertising. 20% from donors and 10% from uh, our audience because we launched our club of readers in 2020 during the COVID pandemic and people supported us as well. Uh, now we changed completely. We received 60% from donors, 30% uh, uh, from advertising and 10% from uh, our readers. Uh, we also received support from different people abroad. We launched our English version uh, with the beginning of war, 21st of February. And uh, a lot of people abroad supported independent Ukrainian media. We launched our campaign for support for independent media, not only for Ukrainian crowd, because for us it's important to support not only our media, it's important to support the whole structure of independent media in our country because this is one of the key elements of uh, democracy. So now, thanks to donors, thanks to uh, our subscribers, we are able to continue to do our job. 
uh, of course, uh, um, I do believe that after this war will end with uh, the victory of Ukraine, we will be back to our model and we will now we'll be back to advertising, more advertising model, more hybrid model than uh, it's now. But of course, the donor support is very important. And uh, I will uh, again uh, thanks, uh, thank, uh, thank the, to a lot of uh, donors and of course people, subscribers, uh, our patrons uh, who supported us during this uh, very exhausting year. RightsCon is a conference that functions at the intersection of human rights and technology. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how your journalists have used technology to gather information for stories. Uh, technology is very important. You know, like I want to uh, maybe uh, t tell you a little bit, um, speak a little bit about uh, citizen journalism as well, because uh, with the beginning of war, of course, we, don't, we didn't have an access for all territories, because uh, the invasion started from different parts of our country. And thanks to our readers from different regions, we were able to continue to report, for, for example, for some. Um, from some cities that were under occupation or under Russian siege, uh, for example, even from Mariupol, Berdyan, and other cities. So here, uh, the, uh, the story of uh, civil journalism is extremely important, and it helped us uh, uh, professional journalists from, uh, from the first uh, days of war. Uh, also, it's all uh, very useful with investigations um, because we investigate, of course, we do investigations, not uh, 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 the major um, part of our investigation now dedicated to Russian war crimes and uh, war crimes that Russia commit and committed in Ukraine. And uh, with uh, these uh, investigations, of course, we don't have an access uh, to people, uh, to Russian soldiers, but we are able to find the personal data in social media. We are able to find, to use all OSINT uh, tools to recognize those people, to find these people and it's it works effectively so we did a lot of investigations thanks to our uh, to to technologies and uh, to to social media and to our tools. and uh, i think that in future we will uh, find the new one because for example one of the main topics now is the deportation of kids uh from ukraine to occupied territories and uh, uh, I mean, uh, from uh, the temporary occupied Crimea in Russia, and we found uh, some of uh, such examples of the deportation of kids even um, uh, two days ago, for example, and uh, thanks to social media, Russian social media. And uh, I hope that with the help of uh, other our partners, we, uh, will, we will be able to uh, investigate this and we'll, we will be able to provide help to our kids. And uh, it will be also useful to return them back to Ukraine. On the flip side, can you talk a little bit about protecting your journalists with technology, from technology, in other words, um, I imagine that there are aggressive attempts from Russian hackers to access your systems, to access your staff's phones. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, of course, I will not provide a lot of details because yes. it's kind of security protocol. Yeah. And uh, but it worked with the beginning of war. It was one of the most effective. Um, security protocol in Ukrainian media and I think in all Ukrainian organizations, because before the beginning of invasion, we understood that we, we will be definitely the target because we are the main uh, source of information for a lot of Ukrainians and we are independent uh, media in Ukraine. Uh, so that's why we did some uh, very important um, things and it helped us uh, to continue our work, even uh, a lot of, uh, even in situations when a lot of sites of our colleagues, a lot of um, sites of our colleagues were just hacked by uh, Russians. And I remember how the first day of, uh, first days of the war, um, one of the most powerful um, attacks um, in uh, Ukrainska Pravda website was around 200,000 requests per second. And even in such situation, we, we survived, our, we saved our, our, our website and uh, continued our work uh, thanks to some uh, very clear um, 
a security protocol and it was actually Google Shield. Uh, it's not secret, and but and other other very important uh, things. You can't give too many details, but I think the 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 takeaway from your story is that being prepared well in advance is incredibly key to the security of everybody. Yes, yes, this is important. And you know, even in certain countries, uh, in a lot of high officials of Ukraine, they promised us that maybe this invasion will not happen. Uh, one week before the invasion, we uh, relocated the part of the um, team uh, to the western part of the country. And that's why even in such a situation where a lot of people were able to um, we're trying to, um, um, to to escape uh, in Kiev. We were able to continue our work in this newsroom, small newsroom, like only six people worked uh, in the Western Ukraine, but still it was very uh, useful and uh, it helped us in the first days of, of this war. Can we now talk a little bit about Russian disinformation? It's been incredibly aggressive and your newsroom and many other newsrooms in, across Ukraine have been working hard and, and frankly not even newsrooms, ordinary journalists, um, ordinary citizens rather, are very active in trying to counter Russian disinformation. H how do you see your newsroom's role in all of this? Um, you know, um we live uh, in uh, such hybrid uh, warfare, uh, information warfare, already for nine years because uh, actually Russia used uh, this propaganda um, with the beginning of uh, annexation of Crimea and occupation of Crimea in 2014. And I do remember that uh, it was actually so how uh, Russian propaganda pictured Ukrainian as a nazist, as a um, fascist and uh, so uh, it, it will be a danger for all um, Crimean people in Crimea so they picture it and uh, yes and yes of so recognizing Ukrainians actually um, helped uh, Russians to start this war against Ukraine in 2022 because uh, Russian people, I mean, Russian population brainwashed by this propaganda and they do believe that uh, one, of, uh, one of the goals of this special military operation, so-called, yeah, but it's war, was kind of denazification of Ukraine, demilitarization of Ukraine, and uh, a lot of soldiers, Russian soldiers, when they came to Ukraine and they were captured, they told that, uh, okay, yeah, uh, I, I came here to liberate some Russian-speaking people, and uh, but then I understood that Russian-speaking people yeah. didn't want that, so they, there is nothing to protect them. Uh, but by the way, so we uh, experienced that already for nine years. So we are highly experienced uh, newsroom, and I think that it's uh, about all Ukrainian leaders. But I, I will tell you that I want to tell that unfortunately, uh, Russia propaganda is still um, one of the key elements of. Uh, Russian diplomacy, and uh, they still spread a lot of this information about the war in Ukraine. Even with this situation with the dam, they accused Ukraine, and they shared this narrative that uh, Ukraine is responsible for that. And they lied, they lied that Bucha was staged, for example, they lied that all war crimes in Ukraine were just uh, uh, staged by uh, Western uh, allies and uh, Ukraine and etc. So. Uh, and I think that unfortunately, in a lot of way, in a lot of countries, uh, they are successful. Um, unfortunately, Russia today was able to continue their work till uh, the beginning of war in 2022. And uh, we asked several times why Russia today is still uh, working in your country in 2018 or in 2019. And, uh, and unfortunately, Russia today is still available in some. Uh, global South countries uh, in Africa, and uh, it also helps um, Russia spread all these uh, narratives and fake stories and news. So I, 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 I'm more worried about uh, the world than about Ukraine, because we know uh, mm. the cost of Russian propaganda, we know uh, how right. Russian propaganda and affect uh, population, but uh, unfortunately, it's still not a big an issue. It's not a big issue for European countries and for the rest of the world. Right. And on that front, um, 
Twitter, Facebook, um, some of the biggest social media companies out there are American, and they're, mm -hmm. they're some of the most harmful in, in terms of spreading disinformation and misinformation, especially Twitter, especially Twitter in the last few months. Um, we see that, we see that, and a lot of Ukrainians reported about that like 24 seven, but there is no reaction. And I think that we, um, you know, like this is so interesting because professional media, all professional media, I mean, uh, in different countries, uh, they have rules, they have responsibility, but social media, they don't have this responsibility. And platforms, they don't have this responsibility, they don't have these rules. And uh, I remember how in 2019, during my year at Darwin, we had this discussion about we should do something with, with Facebook, we should do something with. Uh, spreading like disinformation and actually after that so many stories happen in the world in i mean Myanmar, for example and yeah. the other like how it's effective uh, even with the station in uh, with war in ukraine mm -hmm. uh, i mean the, the disinformation in twitter for example even when embassy of um, russia twitter um, russian embassy in britain twitter published a story that uh, Mariupol uh, story from this maternity hospital was fake story. Right. Uh, it took like one day, mm. one day, just one day. To, uh, just to, to delete the story from Twitter. How it's possible in 21st century? So uh, yeah, I think that uh, the discussion is necessary. We have the discussion, but we don't have a solution. And I think like uh, 2023 and 2024 should become a year of solutions. Uh, because we will face with the same situation during uh, election, elections uh, in the U.S. I mean, in 2024, uh, I mean that there will be a lot of, lot of uh, um, attempts from Russian side uh, with this disinformation and uh, warfare. So I do believe that they are really good with disruption and such things. Well, I mean, you talk about the fact that we need to come up with solutions, but we also need to have a lack of will to do so. And that is something incumbent, frankly, on um, the, the governments where most of this uh, technology is based. We do have one question that's come in from someone, and they are asking, what are some misconceptions you think either the international community or Ukrainian citizens themselves might have about the context in Ukraine right now? Well, uh, very interesting question. Thank you for that. Uh, as I understood, Clea, it's more about um, what uh, the world uh, don't take uh, on account about Ukrainian um, situation or what- Yeah, what, I mean, what, the question, I think what they mean is, are there any um, narratives that you feel like you need to counter or correct that people okay. misunderstand yes. about Ukraine. And it can be yes. people yes. outside of Ukraine, but even inside Ukraine, maybe there's some misunderstandings that your newsroom's always pushing to try to clarify. Yes, uh, thank you. First, um, I will tell about uh, this. This is the biggest decolonial war in uh, the modern world, and it's important to. Um, Spotlight this narrative. I think that uh, this is we're not only just this is not something that happened in 2014 or 2022. This is like the long way for our country to be independent. And uh, I think that the, the colonial narrative is not enough and is not uh, present in Western media, for example, because um, unfortunately. Nobody wants to go back to the history. Nobody wants to learn from the history. Nobody wants to take lessons from history uh, to an account. And that's why even in 2023, after nine years of war, you still hear sometimes that uh, Crimea was kind of a Russian territory, etc. And, you know, like I know uh, the, re the real truth about Crimea because uh, my family was deported in 1944 from Crimea and I'm uh, from the um, Crimean Tatar community. Uh, we are indigenous people of Crimea, and uh, we were deported in 1944, and then Russia uh, settled a lot of people to Crimea. So they changed uh, ethnicity um, 
um, and it was war crime actually. The same situation, for example, with uh, Ukraine, about five million people were killed uh, after, uh, during um, Holodomor, which was a kind of artificial famine created by Joseph Stalin. And after these five million people were killed, uh, again, um, Soviet Union settled a lot of people to these territories from Russia. So, and that's why we have to understand what 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 is uh, hmm. uh, what is the tipping point of this war. This is not something that happened in 2014. This is something that uh, have roots um, for years, years, decades, and uh, even centuries. Uh, I would actually, so, I would just add at this point that for anyone interested in learning about the history of Ukraine and how some of these issues are, go back centuries, I, I, I personally recommend Timothy Snyder's set of absolutely. lectures on the history of modern Ukraine, which is actually posted on YouTube. They're part of his Yale lectures. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just wanted to, to mention no, no, no. because it was a personally and very... And the, yeah. uh, the second one, which narrative is important, of course, we now have a lot of discussion about peaceful process, like, uh, etc. And uh, a lot of uh, people in different countries believe that, some, for, for example, tomorrow, when Russia and Ukraine will sign something, it will uh, so solve all problems. It's not a uh, point anymore. Because in this particular case, we need accountability. We need accountability for Russia and Russian authorities uh, for war crimes that, com that were committed in Ukraine, but again, were committed in Georgia, in Chechnya, in different countries for years and decades. This is also about history, but we don't have this narrative now. Uh, accountability, one of the key uh, priorities for this war. Accountability for Putin, for Russia, and for all people who committed war crimes in uh, uh, Ukraine or other countries, mm. because, um, yeah, it will end for them, but then people uh, will be back because they will feel this impunity and they are able to continue their war crimes and they will be back in decades, etc. So they should pay a huge price uh, just uh, to uh, avoid uh, war crimes and tragedies in future. Sev, any final thoughts? I'm really sorry that I'm not in Costa Rica today. Um, but maybe the last one point will be this conference about human rights and uh, about future of human rights. And I think that Ukraine war is kind of tipping point for a human rights issue as well in the modern world. And um, there is some discussion about uh, why do you support Ukraine, etc. And uh, I want to say that I, I, maybe I will end with a quote of uh, our um, human rights defender, Alexander Mopichuk from Civil Right, uh, Civil uh, from, uh, Civil Liberties Center. She said in her Nobel Peace Prize uh, speech. Uh, it's not you have not to be Ukrainian to support Ukraine. We just need to be human. Don't forget about this. Thank you. Well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us, Sev Musayeva. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And to everyone who've joined, thank you so much. As always, enjoy the other sessions, and we'll be seeing you soon. Stay engaged. <laughs>